welcome, first of all. It's nice to have you. Thank you, Russell. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I guess I will ask you a very broad question. From your perspective, what is autism? Well, that is a really good question. Because <laughs> <laughs> it seems like everyone I talk to has a different definition mm -hmm. for it. Um, you know, uh, so autism means different things to different people, but um, from our perspective at the National Council on Severe Autism, we're concerned with what we consider to be the more severe forms of autism. And that um, usually involves you know, the following traits. You know, number one, very significant challenges in social communication abilities. So um, they're usually minimally verbal, nonverbal, or if they are verbal, they will use language in a very unusual way. Um, they will also have the lack of social reciprocity that you see in typically developing children. Um, there's also usually a degree of intellectual slash cognitive impairment. There are often, although not always, um, abnormal and challenging behaviors, although there's always some level of um, uh, restricted interests or repetitive behaviors. Um, and then a lot of these um, individuals also have um, challenging behaviors that are very notable, such as aggression, self-injury, property destruction, loud vocalizations, for example, some, mm -hmm. sometimes perseverations that mm -hmm. really interfere with, you know, being able to adapt to, um, you know, environments, new environments. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of people in our population have seizures. They often have gastrointestinal intestinal issues. They may have other medical comorbidities um, as well that sometimes go along with a genetic diagnosis, although the vast majority of our population does not have a genetic diagnosis. Okay. Um, so that sums it up. I was diagnosed with autism age 12, even though I, I showed signs as a, a newborn. And my life actually got a lot more difficult w with that label of autism attached to me. Um, a, for the stigma and stereotypes, um, because now I wasn't just that, because I used to be very, I hate to say low functioning, but I, I, I couldn't function at all. And so I wasn't anymore just prior to my di diagnosis, I was that weird kid in the corner of the classroom with his hood on, not making eye contact, crying and sucking his thumb. So once I got diagnosed, I wasn't just that weird kid, I was that weird kid with autism now. See, the most hurt I've encountered in the world has been people who are well-versed in autism because they have this notion Right, preconceived notion of what autism is, and the fact that I don't fit that oftentimes can cause detrimental um, effects. And that I, I wanted to pin, uh, go back to two, th two terms. How do you mesh the two ends of the spectrum and the community in, in general when it comes to terminology? In our case, autism is not only an impairment, it's one of the most aggressively incapacitating impairments in the entire field of psychiatry, right? Yeah. We're talking about people who can't talk, can't read, can't write, can't care for themselves, can't hold down a job, you know, can't really go to school in any meaningful way, um, need 24-7 care oftentimes, often self-injure, often aggress against others, you know, often destroy property. Um, you know, they're so dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just... It's, it, it's the height of insanity mm. to suggest that these people aren't impaired simply because they have an autism label. I mean, mm. look at who they really are. Yeah. And again, this is where labels get in the way of rational thinking. Mm -hmm. Let's be rational thinkers here and let's not be hooked on labels. Um, you know, it's absurd that the term autism is applied so broadly mm -hmm. to so many different phenotypic realities. Mm. Even within the realm of severe autism, there are dramatically different presentations. And that, for example, you see under my own roof. I have two kids with nonverbal autism. Okay. Sophie is 15, She's super mellow, super mild. I just came, I just went to Texas with her for the weekend. Okay. We live in California. Mm -hmm. Not a single problem the whole time. She's a great traveler, a happy kid. She eats anything, you know, she'll, mm -hmm. she'll go along. But, you know, again, very severely autistic. Then you take my son, who's 22. I wouldn't be able to even get him on the plane. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to, you know, take him out for five minutes mm -hmm. because he's so severe and he will elope and he will destroy things and he will be very disruptive. Look at that immense amount of diversity, even within the severe category. Mm -hmm. Now, open that up. 
to the whole realm of autism. And yeah. we're talking about this incredible universe. Right? Yeah. Differences. I find it very lonely and isolating that whether it be in the public speaking realm or on social media, they will comment to me like on my post, oh, you don't have a disability, Russell, you have a different ability. But they, they don't see the struggle that you know, my struggles are invisible. I oftentimes say what you do not see is much more important than what you do see. People sometimes doubt that I struggle. And, and they don't understand the struggle and they don't know how hard it is just to get out of bed every single day. And the fact that I can't get support from my peers in the autism community, it makes me frustrated to say the least. I, I relate more to the severe end of the aut uh, autism because not that I know what it's like to live any life other than my own, but I know what it's like to be misunderstood, forgotten about, uh, um, and just kind of cast aside. Every week, I will have one, two, maybe three days where I completely shut down. Oftentimes, I don't know why. I would assume it's from like a, a death by a thousand cuts of overstimulation, just kind of a drip, 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 then the, the dam breaks. Um, but yeah, just last Friday, um, I was on my couch and I knew what I needed to do to have a successful day, but I just sat there. And my routine is such a double-edged sword because I have severe OCD. And that, along with the rigidity of uh, my routine, um, my routine, I wake up every morning and I have an expectation of myself to, to do this routine. Now, I don't like my routine. I abhor my routine, but it's how I function. It's like my echolocation. I need that familiarity to be able to function. And if that routine is pulled away, I'm like a bat without its echolocation. And so when I'm just too exhausted to do my routine, I cannot function even though I know what to do, I know how to do it. The wires are just not connecting at all. And so I end up just sitting on my couch and crying all day. Um, and again, that's not talked about enough, especially like in Autism Awareness Month. We tend to talk about the positives, hire people with autism, look at these amazing gifts. But if we never talk about the struggle, the suffer, how are employers, how is anybody in general going to know how to help or support an individual when they see them struggling, right? Oh, I completely agree. I'm about telling, talking about reality. I'm about sharing real stories and truth because mm -hmm. I believe that that is the path towards progress. Yeah. I believe that sugarcoating something, you know, and the unicorns and rainbows about autism, it's sort of a nice thing to get people into the world, mm -hmm. but you can't stop there. Yeah. You have to say, but you know what? Autism is a disability. It's a disorder. It's defined in the DSM as a mental disorder for mm -hmm. a reason. Mm -hmm. If it's not a mental disorder, it's not autism, mm -hmm. period, and mm -hmm. a story. And you said something that I think is really, really crucial, which had to do with about, you know, your, your things weren't connecting, your brain wasn't connecting, your wiring wasn't working. But that's what autism is. Yeah. You know, we've seen in brain science, neuroscience, you know, very compelling evidence that autism is rooted in lack of proper connectivity, right, in the brain, yeah. principally the cerebral cortex, and especially the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. where complicated behaviors are rooted, mm -hmm. and where abstract thought occurs. You know, if you don't have the fundamental hardwiring for these behaviors, yeah. you're not going to get them. Yeah. You know, and... I, I think that, that people have to realize that autism is fundamentally a biological disorder. Mm -hmm. It's not some like weird, like psychological difference and different way of being and different way of learning. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, it is a miswiring of the brain during embryogenesis. One thing about me is, you know, I like to talk about what's not talked about because you can't get awareness, let alone acceptance, if you don't talk about what's not talked about, right? And when you don't talk about something, that leads to stigmas and stereotypes. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of, like you said, rainbows, unicorns, glitter, and all that good stuff, and rightfully so. I mean, autism, I, I believe, from my own personal experience, um, and even on the severe end, I've seen, you know, I, I've seen many individuals with severe autism, they're, they're teachers, right? They teach others a new perspective about life. I, I think they bring a lot to others if they're open to it. Um, at the same time, though, autism, I, I wouldn't, autism is the most debilitating thing in my life. Like, I, I would never want anyone to experience my brain. National Council on Severe Autism 
is definitely in favor of breaking up the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. We don't think that having a single unitary ASD diagnosis to apply to so many different clinical Absolutely. realities is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what exactly is the better response is a whole other discussion. Um, but we are definitely not in favor of putting all these people into the same boat. Yeah. Um, just because it's, what's the reason for having clinical diagnoses? Yeah. To have a sort of you know, uniform, homogenous group with similar clinical rep representation so that you can actually say something to the patient about maybe causes, trajectory, outlook, interventions, and research. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with the current definition. Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. It subverts the very purpose of having clinical labels in the first place. Mm -hmm. We're very much in favor of breaking it up. Yeah. Judy Singer... Uh, is somebody who coined the term neurodiversity. She said it was never meant to be used in the way it's been used now. Okay. <laughs> she did, certainly doesn't consider, um, from what I've seen, um, you know, clinical impairment to be neurodiversity, yeah. which is the way you know a lot of the advocates are now using it. Yeah. I don't mind people using the term neurodiversity mm -hmm. if it really is diversity and not impairment. The problem is that they brought in the term to substitute Right for the concept of the impairment of autism, mm -hmm. which is pure and simple nonsense. Absolutely. But what we've seen actually in, in one part of the research world is sort of a grasping, grabbing onto that concept. I think that is one of the deepest betrayals of the autism community in the history of autism. Mm -hmm. And the history of autism has a lot of betrayals, including like the refrigerator mother hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's so much nonsense out mm -hmm. there, unfortunately, and it's become trendy. We have not exactly been very successful in identifying the causes of autism, mm -hmm. right? In 80% of the cases, the causes remain fairly unknown, yeah. right? 70 to 80%. Vast majority of cases, we don't know what's happening. And so we're humans, we don't like voids, we don't like all this uncertainty. So we're like, oh, let's fill that gap with this idea of, you know, it's all natural variation that we never noticed before. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's complete BS, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, we've seen that sort of trending in that direction. And it's sort of like filling a vacuum. Yeah. Neurodiversity is filling a vacuum. Now, I do want to say something I think is important. Mm -hmm. I think that neurodiversity can have incredible clinical benefits for some subset of patients. Like a therapist, she loves neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. She was saying, Jill. And these are her words. These are not mine. I want to make it clear. Okay. She's Jill. I've had patients who are told their whole lives they are losers. They are dolts. They are dorks. They're geeks, you know, mm -hmm. and that, you know, they were bullied, right? And now all of a sudden, instead of being losers, geeks, and dorks, they're neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. she, see, she saw it as like a miracle kind of... Flipping the script. Yeah, yeah, flipping the script, yeah. exactly. It's sort of like a semantic tool, mm -hmm. right, to rise above something really awful. Mm -hmm. And I listen to her, and I'm like, you know what? Hell yeah. yeah. I completely, I would much rather have people, right, have a positive framework mm -hmm. than a negative framework for understanding who they are. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm with her on that, and, um, you know, I, I get that. What's unfortunate, though, is that the concept leads too far, right, into sort of the erasure of real debilitating autism. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with anything out there as long as people speak for themselves, right? And, you know, for me, I make it always known that I am only speaking from my experience, just like with anybody with or without autism, we will never know what life is like for anybody other than ourselves. And um, you know, but I've been to conferences where it, like where I'm literally the keynote, but it says in the conference uh, material prior to um, me submitting my presentation that I have to refer to myself in a certain way. And that is just um, <laughs> I don't even know like the, what to say about that, because I, I just find it uh, I find it very frustrating that. For me, somebody on the spectrum who struggles with his mental health every day, that I, I, if I, it's two things I ask for from the outside world, it's understanding and compassion, right? But a lot of that I, I don't get from the autism community. I get actually more from the general public because they are aware of their ignorance of autism. Somebody mm -hmm. 
walking down the street, they're aware that they don't know. So they're more open to it. But it's when somebody becomes really familiar with autism, and again, they have this image or this set of ideas that they think autism encompasses, that there's no room for them to be a little bit more open-minded as to autism may be for somebody else. So again, it's very bizarre that a lot of uh, the, the pain, the hurt I uh, encounter is from individuals with autism and professionals in the autism community. Again, if people don't know autism, they're much more open to be like, hey, you tell me about it, right? Yeah. 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 Well, it be- it's become, unfortunately, like a cult-like yeah. ideology. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, you're in my cult or you're mm-hmm. not in my cult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's really, really unfortunate mm-hmm. because, you know, we're dealing with serious mental disorders here. Uh, to me, there's no room for, for ideology or cult-like behavior. Mm-hmm. It's all about, you know, science and policy mm-hmm. <laughs> for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm a super duper pragmatic person. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. just the way I'm built. Mm-hmm. And I just want tools that will achieve better outcomes for a very seriously disabled population. Like all this like ideological rancor and all this crazy Twitter verse version of autism, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, it's my identity. How dare you defile my identity? I'm like, I don't care about your identity. Your identity is whatever you want, but it's Mm -hmm. just when you step on my reality. Yeah. That's a problem. Exactly. Um, And anybody, you know, who, and there's a lot of anti-science, in their movement. Okay. It's really concerning. See, I did not know that. So, yeah, expand on that. Go ahead. Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of anti-research, mm-hmm. you know, momentum in, in the neurodiversity movement because, and I see it all the time, like almost every day on Twitter. I don't even know why I go on Twitter. Twitter is like this weird, yeah. parallel universe that's crazy. Like, why do I waste my time? It's a big food fight. That's all Twitter is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why am I here? Yeah, yeah. A food fight. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a good analogy. I'm a huge research advocate. I think nothing is more important than figuring out what is causing autism, what is autism physiologically mm-hmm. in the brain, what can we do to ameliorate the symptoms of autism, what can we do to prevent autism, mm-hmm. um, you know, what kind of policies do we need in order to really serve the growing population of adults with autism. Mm-hmm. These are the things that really, really matter to me among Absolutely. others. Absolutely. But, you know, these, these neurodiversity advocates are like, well, I have made up my mind that autism is just a naturally occurring variation, and all we need is understanding and acceptance, period, go away. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you have to effing be kidding me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but people take it seriously, and yeah. there's, there's a lot of fighting against, you know, basic research in autism, mm-hmm. because we're all supposed to believe, like, kids like mine, who can't think, who can't talk, who can't read, who can't write, who will never be able to do anything important for themselves, that that's a naturally occurring variation. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's such BS. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's sort of taken seriously in certain realms, and it bleeds over, I think, you know, into how we think about research funding, and that's very scary. Since I started this YouTube channel, I've really been getting hit hard with, uh, I guess, from the that community. I, I don't want to say that community, but certain individuals who have a different viewpoint other than mine. Um, and I'm going to catch a lot of flack for even interview. Like I remember when I posted a blog for you last, to like April about authentic awareness, right? I had <laughs> so many, uh, contact forms to my website saying, stay away from, from that organization. And it was like, frustrating doesn't even come close to describing how I felt, right? Because A, they didn't even read my article. They just saw my name attached with National Council on Severe Autism, and they made a good judgment. Um, If they were to read the article, they'd realize that they were being the antithesis of what I asked for in that article. We need to talk about more of the substantive issues. Again, well, let's talk about what's not talked about. So tell me about the, the research advocacy, because I would like to know, because I don't, I don't know why I have autism. I, I mean, maybe I'll get close to figuring out autism one day and then I'll probably die the next day. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever figure my mind out. Is Tell me more about what the latest findings have been in the research field in regards to how autism develops, what is actually occurring with the amygdala and all that stuff. 
Well, I mean, unfortunately, I think we're still many, many mm-hmm. years, if not decades, yeah. you know, behind where we really should be mm-hmm. in terms of um, understanding the etiology of, of autism. I will say this. There's a big debate about whether or not this growth in autism is real or if it's an artifact of expanded diagnosis. Yeah. And the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that it's real. Okay. Right? We see very, very little um, research demonstrating that it is diagnostic substitution or diagnostic threat that is leading to these stupendous increases in the autism rates. Okay. Do you think now, that is has a hand in just overall general awareness, more people wanting to get their children tested? or People have said that, but it's never really been shown okay. to, be, to be the cause. I mean, I'm sure that it's playing like some role, mm-hmm. but here we see you know, a 40 fold yeah. increase in autism. Like for every one person with autism back then, 40 today. We're, mm-hmm. we're not talking about a subtle change. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about a doubling. Yeah. We're not talking about a tripling. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about 40 fold muscle. Mm-hmm. It's not explained. And if you would like me to be able to explain it to you, I can't. <laughs> I come up with hypotheses, yeah. I actually fund research to okay. help explore some of these hypotheses, but they remain hypotheses. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm interested in something called non-genetic inheritance, and your listeners will absolutely go to sleep if I try to <laughs> explain you know, what, it, what it means. Uh-huh. You know, in, in short, mm-hmm. we think about autism, which is very highly heritable, as being a genetic disorder. Mm-hmm. My argument is you can have something that's highly heritable, but not necessarily genetic. Okay. And so what can be those non-genetic causes of heritability? That mostly comes to something called epigenetics. I don't know if you've heard of I have not, no. Um, these are molecular factors that change how genes work okay. without actually changing the gene sequence. Okay. The one thing that I would ask about you, for example, would be like, I don't think you have a genetic mutation, because, and I can tell because you aren't dysmorphic. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have a lot of these intellectual disabilities and physical disabilities that often come with having a mutation. Interesting. And what you may have is something that dysregulated the way your brain developed hmm. because of the way the gene expression of brain-related genes were mm-hmm. altered. Why did that happen? So that's what I focus on. It's just a little bit advanced. Your audience is like, okay, I'm asleep now. Let's I'm wide awake. This is fascinating <laughs> to me. Let's move on. <laughs> um, but I, I don't pretend that that's the only thing. Mm-hmm. You also see causes such as um, extreme prematurity is associated mm-hmm. with autism risk. Um, you know, there are certain drugs in the past, for example, anti epileptic drugs, okay. um, uh, which have led to autism risk. There's some evidence that some forms of infection and um, inflammation in the fetus can read can lead to increased autism risk but there are other things as well um, that are not fully understood or explored so to me it's like do we want to prevent autism of course we want to prevent autism Mm -hmm. but we just don't know how we yeah we really are are still way you know far away from understanding it yeah and uh, like again even that word prevent is a trigger word for a lot of people right prevent autism don't it's crazy it is it is you know we just had uh, uh, somebody uh, publish something last week on our blog um, about what she called the moral. She's a very devout Catholic. And mm-hmm. She called it the moral duty to prevent autism. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and she pointed out something that I always point out, which is like we are a society almost obsessed with preventing neurodevelopmental disability in mm-hmm. children. Yeah. Right? We've done this for decades mm-hmm. um, through many means. You know, we give... Uh, you know, mothers folic acid and prenatal vitamins. We warn them against drinking. Mm-hmm. You know, we try to prevent infections. We promote vaccination, which can prevent brain damage. You know, on, the list goes on and on and on and on. And of course we want to. We've always done it this way, mm-hmm. right? Um, autism shouldn't be any different. Yeah. I mean, you know, if people say, well, autism is a great thing. It's not a disability. Um, I would say that they probably don't have autism, right? Because mm-hmm. autism is divine, defined by an mm-hmm. impairment. Yeah, and I think that goes hand in hand with, you know, people identifying with autism in totality. I think, again, the identification of themselves with autism. For me, I I don't want to be seen as somebody with autism. I just want to be seen as a human and as Russell. And um, would I go back and prevent myself from having autism? Obviously not, because I would stick with what I know, right? But I would say that, you know... (laughs) 
again, I, I wouldn't want my life to be experienced by anybody else. Like, I've never had closure as to why. And closure, again, it kind of goes hand in hand with validation. When, like, if I break my leg and my leg hurts, I'm like, okay, well, that's because I broke my leg. But when I am struggling, out of seemingly the freaking blue, I perseverate and I ruminate on the why because I don't know. And that is probably the most destructive because it just compounds everything I'm already struggling with is because I don't know why this is happening. My meltdown, my, my, my OCD rituals going up through the roof, my depression hitting me out of the blue. And so that lack of closure is, uh, you know, I would love if we could put some more emphasis on the research, especially during April, right? It's, we, there has been a shift from Autism Awareness Month to now Autism Acceptance Month in April. We're not even aware of what autism encompasses yet, so how can we accept it, right? Yeah, uh, Autism Acceptance Month is something that NCSA definitely opposed. Um, well, mm. we, of course, believe that everyone should be accepted, should be excluded yeah. from society, yeah. should be included to the maximum extent possible. Mm. Totally agree with that. But the idea of accepting autism as sort of a natural thing that doesn't require, um, you know, clinical and research support, no way. Yeah. No way. <laughs> I know. Way, 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 you know, too early to say that. And also, um, who... Who wants to accept the fact that, you know, we're seeing these increased, really dramatically increasing rates of very serious neurodevelopmental dis disability in kids? Responsible societies say, oh my F God, mm -hmm. what can we do yeah. to prevent this in future generations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I find it like, you know, I've been on certain areas in my professional work uh, where I'm on a call and, and, you know, I can't speak my mind because all the other adults with autism are, are, are celebrating how wonderful the diagnosis is. And again, it's like, why celebrate being part of a marginalized community, right? It's like an underprivileged community. Why are we celebrating that? Well, I think it might go back to what this woman said to me a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, who loves and she loves neurodiversity mm -hmm. so much for the fact that it substitutes for a negative narrative. Yeah, It's a positive narrative that's substituted for a negative narrative. And she wants any tool she can to help mm -hmm. her clientele. Her clientele is also all high function or not just yeah. like mine, right? Mm -hmm. So I I think that's that might be part of it. You know, her her, her yeah. observation. And, and I again I again my the thing that gets me is just people speaking for other people, right? And I think that's just been the main underlying theme in this whole conversation is you can say whatever you want. I don't care how you see yourself. I don't care what you call autism. Just please don't speak for me. But oftentimes <laughs> People always speak for me. And if I try to speak for myself, I get attacked, right? And it's like, okay, it, it makes me sometimes just want to find a different career to be on. And maybe just go over to the mental health community and, and leave the autism community behind. But then I realize that I need to be here because there are a lot of people that, you know, feel like me, right? And, and I need to use this yeah. platform to, to spread that, again, that authentic awareness about what autism encompasses for me, for me and others and like me. Should. Yeah. I mean you should tell your own story, your own truth. You have to. I, mm -hmm. And I, I, I do understand that it can be incredibly exasperating and painful to be in this world and be yeah. attacked every day. Let's talk about therapeutics. Um, obviously, there's a huge need for better therapeutics in general in the whole spectrum. But when it comes to severe autism, what do those therapeutics look like? How do we, how do we have better access to them? Are they even accessible to the average family? Break it down for us. Really important question. Now, what I will say right now, I'm speaking for myself mm -hmm. and not as NCSA. Okay. I think all of us have a slightly different spin mm -hmm. on therapeutics. Um, it is hardly a settled area, mm -hmm. to say the least. There's been um, a very heavy emphasis on early intervention in autism, mm -hmm. as I think you know. Um, and that's not just ABA, there's also an emphasis on speech therapy, on occupational therapy, on sensory therapies, on social therapies, on, you know, physical therapies, all kinds of things, you know, food therapies, you name it, nutritional therapies, a lot of emphasis on early intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at the data, I don't see tremendously strong evidence that 
all of this early intervention is making a dramatic difference for our mm-hmm. population. Yeah. I do think it does help in some cases, and I'm, I would never deny that. But I think that this emphasis is misplaced. I think we really need to think more about, especially for the severe population, it might be a little different Mm -hmm. for the high function. Um, I think we need to really think about intervention as very, um, a lifespan issue, right? Um, And um, this idea that early intervention is necessarily going to change trajectories very dramatically, I think is a Overhyped would be the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. It's very much overhyped for our population. I would much rather see more emphasis on lifespan changes. Now, look even at you, Russell. I mean, you're somebody whose presentation and whose characteristics have really changed over the years. You know, yeah. think about that kid with the hood in class. You're no longer that kid. I mean, you have your issues mm-hmm. now, but they're different. Than before, I mean, I think that the opportunities for intervention are not just ages two to five. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very much you have you you see these kids being more attuned and more, I think, open to intervention sometimes later in life mm-hmm. than early in life. And a lot of people would attack me for saying that, yeah. especially the ABA people. Mm-hmm. And I'm just calling calling it like I see it. Mm-hmm. Right? Again, I'm not an ideologue. I kind of look at things realistically. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that ABA made absolutely no difference for my children. Mm-hmm. They both underwent, you know, intensive programs. Didn't make a shred of difference. Mm-hmm. My daughter is um, the kind of kid who actually responds better now as a teenager mm-hmm. than she did as a little kid. She was very okay. closed off as a okay. little kid. My son has gotten worse. Okay. He's received probably more than a million dollars worth of interventions over his lifetime. He's mm-hmm. 22. Is far worse off now than he was before. Okay, all is the that, interventions in the world didn't make a shred of difference. Did him. the interventions okay. negatively impact him at all, or I don't know. I don't think they negatively okay. impacted him. I mean, that's my hunch. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't know, know, right? I mean, that's a tough time, thing. Right? Yeah, he hasn't had ABA in God knows how many years. Okay, you know, more than ten years. Sometimes I think we just. We, we kind of look at early intervention as mm-hmm. a sort of magical bullet mm-hmm. that will really help change trajectories. I don't see a lot of data for that at all. Mm-hmm. And I really think we need to think longer term. Some of these individuals are much more open to therapy later in life. Mm-hmm. What I see with the severe population is they really, really, really need more therapy when they're older. Yeah. Because that they makes really sense. can't access society. They can't be included. Mm-hmm. They are often shut off. They can't even leave the house because their behaviors are so severe. That's when we need more help, right? Because they are essentially jailed for the rest of their freaking lives because their behaviors are too severe to allow them to access the community. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, we're, we're not even talking about that, right? We're, we're, we're still focusing on ABA for the young kids. Yeah. It's like, come on. You know, it just doesn't help that much sometimes over the long term for this population. Say there's a single mom out there. She's, you know, just there's not a lot of extended relatives or anything like that. And once she passes away, she has a son or a daughter with severe autism. What happens? Well, I mean, you, you, you just asked the $64 billion question, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it's not just for the single parents, mm-hmm. even when, in other families, but it's yeah. especially acute in families like the ones you just mentioned. Um, we don't have a plan, mm-hmm. right? What happens when parents like me die? We don't have a plan. We're not even thinking about it. Yeah. We do not have a plan. You know, our insurance policy, if you will, as a nation is Medicaid, right? We yeah. don't, there's no private insurance policy for autism. Yeah. Um, and the Medicaid system is completely. Uh, ill prepared. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We really don't have it. And mm-hmm. so what happens is, you know, the the state Medicaid system you know, get these adults who desperately need help whose parents cannot care for them anymore, whether they're alive or dead. Mm-hmm. They don't know what to do with them. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I, I just talked to a mom the other day who's been in an emergency room, basically living at the hospital for two months with her violently autistic son. Because her state has nowhere to put him. Mm-hmm. This is increasingly common, Russell. We also hear a little bit more about relinquishment, right? Which is parents saying, like, I can't do it anymore. I'm relinquishing my child to the yeah. state because I, I can't 
physically do it. And I'm mm. ill. Maybe I have cancer. Maybe I have heart problems. Maybe I have dementia. I can't do it anymore. You know, all of us parents are temporary beings. Yeah. We're biological blobs that will break down. Mm -hmm. We yeah. won't be able to care, you know, for our kids forever. We're in denial. We have our head in the sand about it. So what we really need more than anything is a very robust, you know, federal response. I have suggested very strongly that what we, what we need is a new Medicaid waiver system mm -hmm. specifically for these severe adults who need comprehensive care. Okay. That's uh, great. We do not have that mm -hmm. right now. We have a system that's antiquated and really based on a developmental disability profile that's very different from autism. Yeah. It's based on stuff like Downs and CP. And when you think about it, the people with Downs and CP didn't generally outlive their parents. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Our kids are going to outlive us. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to think about it. It's hard and it's expensive and it's very depressing. It is. And it's like when we talk about relinquishment, um, you know, I can just hear people saying, oh, well, how could a parent do that to their child? And it's, uh, it's, there's so many things taken out of context. Again, I can't imagine suffering as a parent. You know, I've seen my mom my whole life. You know, I was attached to her hip for 30 years prior to six weeks ago when I moved. This is the first time I've been fully independent. And throughout those 30 years, you know, I, I started suffering and then she would suffer because she saw me suffering and I would suffer more because of that. And to see, uh, to know that there are worse cases than mine um, and to think of my mom loving me so much that she doesn't know how to help me, that she has to give me up. It breaks my heart. But then these moms and dads get attacked for even thinking about it or for even asking that question. And again, there's a lack of humanization when it comes to, from what I see, you, you know better than me, from severe autism. We act like these people and their families and everyone around them are these automatons who can just go, 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 go. And it's like they don't realize burnout happens. They don't realize the, these parents have emotions. And, and it's like, how do you contextualize a, severe autism, B, caring for an individual with severe autism. How do you contextualize that for people to, because people just don't get it? How do you break it down for them so people can kind of get their feet wet, in a sense? Well, these people, you know, these, these, the online, you know, mm -hmm. actually autistic, you know, mob, you know, hashtag actually autistic, mm -hmm. um, they haven't spent a day of their lives, mm -hmm. you know, caring for someone like my son. Mm -hmm. They yeah. don't have a clue. They yeah. really don't know. They're, mm -hmm. they're very naive. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see in the parent community is that, you know, when the parents give up, when they have to either legally relinquish their child or physically relinquish their child because, you know, and you know, move them to a care home or whatever, it really is after tremendous crisis where they have no choice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is what happens. It's not like parents are like, oh, my child is inconveniencing right. me. I'm going to put him in a group home. No, yeah, it's right. nothing like that. Okay. Yeah. It's like, it's too dangerous mm -hmm. to keep the child at home, either for the child or the parent or oh, yeah. the siblings or all of the above. Yeah. Right? It's where, you know, they can't they get the help that they need mm -hmm. at home, which is really a national disgrace that parents can't get the help they need. Uh, but unfortunately, that's a pervasive problem. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it's often when parents, you know, when they're suffering some sort of physical or mental ailment, which again is inevitable in every single case, mm -hmm. that they can no longer execute their responsibilities the way, you know, that's needed. You know, that's what happens. This is not people doing things because they dislike their children or they don't want to help their children. It's really when there's no other choice. Um, and I will be honest and say that's what happened with me and my son. Mm -hmm. I, we, we were in such dramatic crisis and we could not find any other solution. So we actually had to move him out of the house. Now, was this something I wanted? No, I had always imagined that he would live with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And that is what I wanted. When it became physically completely untenable, it, and we had no other choice than, you know, we did it. But was was it something I wanted to do? Of course not. Yeah. No. It was it was painful on every possible level. 
I would yeah. challenge any of those online people to come try to take care of my son and then tell me <laughs> that there was <laughs> another answer here. There just wasn't. Yeah. Um, it, it's and like, I was lucky that I was able to, you know, find a solution. A lot of families can't, and they're living in crisis not only day after day, but like hour after hour after hour. Absolutely. And they lose their own life, right? I mean, it's 24-7. They have to sacrifice their life uh, for their child. Oh, yeah. And again, it's not like that's, uh, I don't know, I feel like we as a society um, push these individuals and their families into a corner and, and uh, with no way out and then expect them to somehow dig their way out by themselves. Uh, and on top of that, we throw insults and all these declarations on top of them while they're backed into this corner, simply struggling for some open mindedness and some supports. Right. It's like oh. the absolute epitome of what not to do to any human, to any human. And again, that's why I say like there's a lack of humanization behind severe autism. I mean, we're talking about kids or adults, right? That inflict self injury. You know, they bang their mm -hmm. head, they bash their eyeballs. They scratch themselves, they bite off their own skin, they peel off their own skin, you know, they destroy their walls, they break their windows, they elope from the house despite parents trying everything, right, mm -hmm. to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll eat, you know, inedible objects, they'll eat dirt, they'll eat rocks, they'll eat leaves, they'll eat plastic, they'll eat toys, they'll eat the furniture, they'll eat you know, the shutters behind me. My son ate the freaking shutters, you know, behind me. Um, the kids will be screaming and screeching often for hours, you know, at a time. Um, they'll need, you know, some kind of specific feeding protocol. I mean, these parents, uh, there's only so, they're human. There's only so much that they can do. Often these, these, these kids or adults pose threats to their siblings who are often yeah. defenseless. Mm -hmm. And they often have autistic siblings who are double defenseless. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, people, mm -hmm. have a grip on reality, have a heart, see what's going on yeah. in this incredible level of dysfunction. No, they, they, they need, there, there's almost no other subpopulation of Americans that need more help than these families, mm -hmm. right? And here are, is this group of people who are like all of a sudden instant, you know, instant experts yeah. on their lives telling them that they suck. It's like, yeah. you have to freaking be kidding me. Yeah. Come walk the day in my shoes. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. Yeah, and I, I just want to underscore too, um, and you can expand on this, that, you know, like the, the, the violent behavior, it's not like these individuals want to be violent, it's an outlet, no, because no, like I when me, never, never yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, for me, like when I have a meltdown, I usually have a panic attack on top of that, and sometimes somatic seizures, and, and the, the intent, my brain just feels like it's on absolute fire, and it's in a vice grip at the same time, and so I will, you know, mainly my chest, but sometimes my head just hit or myself or any hard object to I, because I'd rather fi feel the physical pain than the mental anguish, right? Wow. So for me, it's a distraction. I will smack my head as hard as I can because for me, it's an outlet. Um, and am I going to hurt myself physically? I'll get some bruises. But let, let's understand that, you know, people listening to this, that these, uh, these kids, these adult, adults with severe autism, they don't want to harm anybody. They are just in so much agony that they need an outlet. They don't know what to do. Yeah, I mean, I definitely would never blame you know one of these adults mm -hmm. for their behavior. Yeah. I think yeah. it's it's a factor of their miswiring. Sometimes it's you know something like you like like you said. It's mm -hmm. just a I don't want to call it a soothing response. It's not soothing. It's I mean, an unhealthy coping mechanism. A coping mechanism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a better term. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, other times they just like my son like. He just can't organize his brain towards any very constructive activity. Mm -hmm. But he's bored. Mm -hmm. He needs something to do. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He shreds the sheets. He'll you know chew on the upholstery. He'll start ripping the mm -hmm. upholstery. He used to go through a mattress every couple days, sometimes every day. Mm -hmm. New mattress almost every day, just shredding the mattress. Because that's something he was able to do. It mm -hmm. occupied him. It was yeah. interesting to him. Did I blame him? Did I think, oh, my son is such a destructive human? Not for a second. Mm -hmm. but my God, this is something that he that is interesting to him and occupying him. Yeah. That's what he's capable of. He is a destruction machine, not because he's a bad person, mm -hmm. but because he can't organize his brain around construction. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... 
you know, I, I, I again, you're, 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 I totally get what, get what you're saying. When it comes to severe autism, is there research or just has there been like use in your experience for cannabis oils for individuals with severe autism and how that may affect them? Families are desperate and sometimes the generally available pharmaceutical interventions have not helped their children. So they start experimenting with different forms of cannabis products, whether they're more CBD based or whether they're more THC based or something else. So we see a lot of that, mm -hmm. a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and they do it usually for anxiety related reasons, sometimes for sleeplessness, sometimes for you know, the aggression mm -hmm. and the self injury, a lot of different reasons. We're really just starting, you know, to, to look at some of the evidence, mm -hmm. and sometimes that evidence is only about CBD and not THC, mm -hmm. for example, and so it's a very different type of intervention, even though they both fall under you know, yeah. cannabis. We need every tool we can get for yeah. severe autism, every tool, because these people and these families are often living in hell, mm -hmm. and any possible therapeutic that can help, I am 100% in favor of. For me, I, I discovered cannabis last year, and uh, CBD, I've never noted, noticed any effects, no matter how much I take. THC, I need that psychoactive ingredient to get a different perspective on how I operate, and it has been more, I've been on over 30 medications throughout my life, from Clonopin to Seroquel to Xanax, I mean, you just name it all, I've been on them. Yeah. I have never experienced uh, the alleviation of my autism and specifically OCD symptoms more than I have with cannabis, THC. And the fact that I can mix and match, because I'll smoke it, um, to be able to counteract some, like if I get paranoia, that I can mix it with another strain and counteract that paranoia while keeping the benefits. Um, it's worked better than, again, any pharmaceutical, and I don't have to ask for permission to, to use it, right? I don't say, please, doctor, <laughs> please let me have a medication. And, yeah. you know, the research is very lacking. I feel completely normal when I'm high, and you don't even know. I, I just act like a normal, like when I'm high, you, nobody can even tell because I just, I act more normal. Now, here, I'm, I'm passionate, right? And I'm not high, but when I talk about my passions, I'm more at ease. When it's the day-to-day -day life, going grocery shopping, doing like just errands, getting out of the house, um, when I get stuck in that executive dysfunction mode, THC connects those wires and I can get off the couch and be functional. Um, so it's, it's, I am tremendously curious about how it affects my brain, uh, but how it can be used in, in individuals with severe autism as well. There's actually some, some scientific reasons that has to do with certain um, the function of certain neurotransmitters mm -hmm. and certain receptors mm -hmm. on neurons yep. that may be affected positively um, by uh, uh, the use of THC. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there, there really may be something valid behind your experience. There is a prevalence of a dysregulation in the endocannabinoid system in individuals with autism. And exactly. I think that is yes, exactly. where my wires yeah, connect. That may yeah. be Mm -hmm. of our kids. I know we're running out of time, but I did want to ask you about one last thing. When it comes to encounters with your kids specifically, um, or experiences you've had, and, and first responders, but mainly police officers, how do you deal with that? How, how do you make police officers more aware? How, how, do, you, do you fear for your kids? Tell me about it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a big issue. You talk about being out in the community, which I'm in favor of, mm -hmm. of course, but I am definitely scared, mm -hmm. you know, that he, he's an eloper, that he mm -hmm. will run off and someone will report him. People have reported him in the past and that it could be met with, you know, officers with guns. Yeah. Officers have to often react in the moment yeah. and they often have to react on very limited information. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do sympathize with them. Yeah. So how do we make it clear that this is a case of mental incapacity and not a case of criminal intent? You know, how do we do that? It requires more training on the part of officers, and it also requires more identification, right, of the individuals who look normal, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think it will be a growing problem as we see this population increasing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. My biggest fear in life um, is getting shot killed by police. I, I've had many, many close calls, mainly in airports, but thank God my mom has been with me every time to be the buffer and say he has autism. Um, because again, I, there have been times where I've been like in the middle of a street and I just get absolutely triggered 
and I get that fight or flight adrenaline rush. That's when I start hitting myself. I'll start screaming. And the fact that, you know, I don't look like I have any kind of disabilities um, is very worrisome for me. And I, I've trained many, uh, you know, first responders in the past. And uh, I remember one time I, I relayed how I behave when I have a panic attack and meltdown. And I asked the, the police I was training, what, what would you do if you saw an individual like that? They, they said, I would give you a command. And I said, well, if I, if I didn't respond to that command, then what would you do? Um, and, and one person actually said they would pull their gun. Um, because they, would th they said they, they would think I was like high on meth or something. And um, that scares me. You know, just like my first week here in L.A., I was driving and uh, waiting to get gas. And the gas station was just like there was a long line and it was just like utter chaos. And I was supposed to be there, uh, be somewhere on time. And then someone's car alarm goes off and I just get triggered. And when I get to the precipice, especially out in public like that, when I know I'm about to just have a full blown meltdown and panic attack. I get very scared I, because I, there's nowhere for me to go. There's no, nothing I can do because at that point I cannot express myself and I can hear, but I cannot process anybody's commands because of my brain is just too overloaded. It's like a computer, right? It's like running too many programs on a computer and it just shuts down and I short circuit. And so for me, that's a huge, I don't want to say passion of mine. It's just more of a, uh, a fear that I don't want this to happen to me or others. If I had it my way, see, I don't even know what my way would be. I really don't. And that's what scares me is I don't even know how to handle myself in that situation. Why would I expect somebody else to? And that's, again, what's not talked about, right? We don't talk about that during Autism Awareness Month. There's no awareness behind that. How are we going to accept that when there's no awareness? And that's what really, I guess, pisses me off is those literally life or death things that nobody is talking about and that we've been talking about the majority of this interview. 90% of these issues that create divide in our community or fears in our community would be solved with uh, more and more emotional awareness and intelligence. I firmly believe that's the foundation on how we can really dissect these issues and get down to the solutions that um, should be in front of us by now. But again, autism awareness has been alive uh, and well for about, I don't know, 20, 30 years, but we really haven't made much progress at all, except for really the recognition of the word. Yeah. I mean, we, it is shocking how much progress we've made. And in fact, I think we've gone backwards. We have. In some way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because again, it's that, it's that people thinking they know, and mm -hmm. because people are more familiar with autism, they will say, oh yeah, I know autism. My, my, my best friend's cousin's niece has autism, but they're not, it's like, I know what uh, astrophysics is, but I, I, I can't tell you anything about it, right? So again, it's that level of knowing to be aware of our ignorance. Yes, very well put. Yeah. Very well put. Yeah. Check out National Council on Severe Autism, ncsautism.org. Okay. Sign up for our free newsletter. We are also very active on Facebook. So you just type in National Council on Severe Autism. I, I don't even understand why people even think about calling us a hate group. There's nothing hate, hate dish about us. We exist because we love our kids. We love the autism community. We love kids with autism. We love adults with autism. We want the absolute best for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're about as far from a hate group as we can get, but people mm -hmm. will just throw you know, crazy, uh, you know, slings and arrows at mm -hmm. for no reason. We're really grateful for the work that you do, Russell. Um, you. We are grateful for anybody who brings out important issues mm -hmm. and talks about them in a realistic and urgent way, which you do. So, you know, thank you for all you do. I, I certainly personally wish you continued improvement, health, mental health and physical thank health you. and um, happiness in L.A. Thank you, Jill. It's been a pleasure connecting with you and thank you for being on. Thank you for all the work you do for just uh, being a fighter. I mean, I honestly don't know how you do it. Just uh, taking all the, the hits every single day and still continuing to keep that inner fire to move forward. Autism, it's this long trajectory. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's just these kids, Yeah. you know, and look, and you're, you're seeing improvement you know, well past adolescence, well yeah. past young adulthood. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
we have to think that way. We have to think long term. I know. I call adults with autism a mythical creature. Once they turn 18, it's like they don't exist. Maybe people have seen them, but nobody really believes they're out there. A mythical creature. Yeah. Thanks, Russell. Yeah, thank you, Jill.